Empire. It's a big week in the NFL, week 17, and it's huge for a number of reasons. And we're getting into it all here on this episode of the Football Jones Podcast. What's up, everybody? I'm Mike Jones. Thanks for coming back for another episode. You can read me at usatoday.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at by Mike Jones. And as I said, it's week 17. There's a number of teams who are battling for their playoff lives. But this is a big week because we are at a point where we didn't know if we were going to actually make it here because of COVID. The NFL had every intention of getting this season done. They were determined that they were going to try to get it in in 17 weeks and not have to add um, extra weeks for the regular season, and it looks like they're about to make that happen. But this is also a big week because with the final games of the regular season being played means Black Monday looms, and that's when the heads start to roll for head coaches and when the whole hiring process ramps back up. And so... I wanted to have Jim Trotter, longtime NFL reporter um, from the NFL Network, on because we're going to talk about COVID, how the NFL and its players and coaches got this season in in 17 weeks without interruptions. We're going to talk about the NFL hiring process, which is always a fascinating but controversial um, matter because of the lack of diversity in those head coaching um, and general manager positions. And so we're going to take a deep dive into it right now. Really good conversation here. um, And I think you're going to learn some things from it. So let's get to it with Jim Trotter right now. All right. And here we are with my guy, Jim Trotter from NFL Network. Trot, how you doing? Good, bro. It's kind of cold out here this morning in California. So, um, so I hope people understand why I'm dressed the way I am. It does get cold in California, what, Southern what California. Counts as, what counts as cold right now? Anything below seventy. <laughs> you know and that's 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 any time, not right now. That's any time. So how would you and your dog handle like like hanging out with me and my dog as we go walking every morning and it's like twenty something, thirty something degrees? Uh, it's a question I can't answer because we've never been in that situation. But the one thing I can say is if we were in that situation, I think we'd be okay because we know we're going back home at some point <laughs> to where it's warmer. So, and I always do that e- even as i um, flying around the country for work and whatnot, whenever I go into a bad weather situation, whether it's Minnesota in December, or January, or, or something like that, I'm always cool because I say in two or three days, I'm going to be back in Southern California, so I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, you know, you're cracking me up there that, you know, cold, you know. And, and I mean, like, I, I, I don't deal well with the cold very much, but, you know, 50s is kind of almost not quite short sleeve weather, but it's definitely just like, you know, grab Bro, a hoodie, you know. 50 here is burn your fireplace, put the blanket around you, and have the hot chocolate. So, we ain't no nah, we ain't doing 50 and look we here in southern california we own our 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 um weakness yeah. you know we we i don't have any problem saying I, i'm i'm not built for the cold you know which was funny when i left california to go to, to college to go back to howard i had never been in the snow before you know i'd never experienced winters like that and so I remember just trying to walk on on the sidewalk, you know, <laughs> after a snow, what that was like, you know, the the treachery, the treachery of that. So, um, but again, I knew it was temporary, so I was good, handled it. But, you know, if you don't have to live in it, why live in it? Yeah. You know? Hey, no, I agree with you completely. And look, at least you could check off the box. You know, you experienced it with college and you knew what's right for you. And, and there you are. Um, but first, yeah. I also I forgot to apologize. I left out the Huddle and Flow podcast when I introduced oh. you. Uh, because, oh, all good, man. You, know, you are now a member of the podcast world, as everybody knows, um, because, you know, you guys are doing big things there. You and Steve Weiss there. Are you liking it? Yeah, yeah, I am. It's, it's, um, it's, it's more work, I think, than people think if you're going to try and do it right from the standpoint of, 
you know, the, the amount of time that's involved with research to, to hopefully make sure you can ask uh, semi-intelligent questions to whoever your guest is. And, um, you know, it was funny because I remember when we had uh, Arthur Blank on the Falcons owner and we had asked him a question about, I think Steve had asked it about what he was looking for in a coach or, or something like that. And he's just put out a new book um, and he said to us, well, have you read the book? And, and we had, you know, so we could, re we could refer to things that were actually in the book and questioning him. But I just thought about it. I'm like, man, he really thinks he's got a gotcha moment with yeah. us. Like, you know, like we're not going to do our homework or we're not going to prepare. And we later heard that many of the people who had interviewed him hadn't read the book before they, they interviewed him. And, um, I'm not here to pass judgment on any of that. I'm just saying I, I don't like being caught with my pants down. So, yeah. So that's taken more time, but it's um it's been fun. It's been good. The only thing I found truly, Mike, is that you want to spend more time with these people than you have allotted for the show. Yeah. And like when we had Chuck D on, I'd be on with Chuck D, you know, all day and never get all my questions in, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, even with Jamel and Carrie, um, when they were on or Sean Payton, whoever, it's just like, these people are so interesting that I feel like I have more questions than we have time. Yeah, yeah. And that clock, like I try to set a timer. So I'm seeing it tick down. It moves yeah. fast. Um, you're like, Oh, no, I'm only through like three questions right here. You know, um, absolutely. I want to keep moving. But no, this is good stuff. So I don't want to rush it. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. I feel your pain on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I wanted to have you on because we talked early in the year um, as we were not sure what this season was going to look like. Um, and here we are, um, our first episode of 2021, and we are days away from the final weekend of NFL action of the regular season. Um, what surprised you the most about the way this season has played out? Well, the first thing that surprised me is that I'm actually your first guest of 2021. So... I feel honored. That's uh, oh well, that's, that's like amazing. A, of course, that hey, that, that's amazing. So I appreciate that. Um, what is it? What is uh, my thoughts on the season? Number one, I wasn't sure, as I'm sure many of us um, were not sure that the NFL would get through this season without missing games or um, extending the season, those sorts of things because of COVID nineteen. And I have to say that, you know, setting aside the debate of whether or not games should even have been played at all, the fact that, that the union and the league agreed to play games, I'm going to operate against that backdrop. Um, so for me, for them to get through this season without a major outbreak lead why, um, I think is a testament to both the discipline of the players and the coaches and the team employees, uh, because it would have been very easy. I could have very easily seen some sort of outbreak occurring when you're talking about having clubs um, playing football, a violent collision sport, yeah. um, and you know the league making it to this point. So where we go from here, I don't know. Um, I know that they wanna get fans into the stadium if possible, as safely as possible, that sort of thing, but um, it's going to be interesting to see if they can pull that off for the playoffs or even the Super Bowl. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I'm also curious, look, they, like you said, they got everything in. They didn't have to add a, uh, an 18th week, uh, but there, there were some instances where they needed flexibility. And now there is no flexibility um, for the most part, as far as, you know, the playoffs, they got to get in, you know, they got to get these games in. And if you're moving one game back, Tuesday, then that hurts your you know preparation time for that next Sunday game or the Saturday game and everything. So there's less wiggle room. Um, but I'm really interested to see, you know, can they um, can they operate in their adamant? No, we're not going to a playoff bubble. No, like the owners, uh, the league side, the NFL Players Association side, everybody is adamant that no, we don't need to do this. Um, you know. For now. Yeah. For you know, now. That's what they're I always saying. use that. I use that caveat always for now. Because typically when they talk about this stuff, it's we have no plans. We have no desire. All of which means that things could change in a hurry, you know, if something were to happen. So um, 
you know, I, I'd be curious as we got closer to as the playoffs uh, dwindled down and you have fewer teams and you get closer to that Super Bowl, if then you decide whether or not we need to sort of quarantine those two teams to make sure that nothing happens. And so for me, I just say anything's possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't rule anything out. But, you know, the the. If I could say one thing that's been the overriding thing for me this season from a personal standpoint, it's just the strangeness of watching games with no fans yeah. and talking to players about just how strange that is. Um, it's, it's bizarre, man. I, I can't, I find myself having trouble really getting into the games as I did previously because the emotion of an NFL game or a sporting event um, is a big part of it. And the fans are a big part of that. And players will tell you they draw energy from fans. You know, you may not, it, it's, it's hard to have that, you know, that um, energy meter on 100% every week to start a game. And, you know, you can always draw on that, you know, when your home team um, realizes that and kind of gives you that extra boost, that adrenaline rush and whatnot. So, that's the one thing I would say for me personally this season is, man, I just can't get used to to these events without fans. It, it just, it, I, I don't know how to describe it. it it's, it's, it's like, um, I don't know. I don't know. It's the cake without the icing. I, I don't, you know, I, I just can't, I can't put it into words. It's just weird for me. Yeah, it is very weird, especially when you're watching a broadcast and they do that overview and it's pulled back and you see just how empty that stadium is. Um, and it's just like, man, it's weird. I mean, I've been in a few stadiums. I've been on the road a lot, but I've been on a few stadiums where, um, you know, you don't even hear, you know, that piped in crowd noise that you hear on TV, um, you know, and it's just so quiet. Um, yeah, the, I, the first two weeks I traveled up to L.A. with the opening of the new stadium. So I was there for the um, Rams opener and then the Chargers opener. And after that, I said, there's no reason to go to any game. You know, um, first of all, we have no access to anyone before game or after game in terms of in person. Everything is by Zoom call. And then secondly, um, the lack of energy in the stadium um, is just it's offsetting. It's off putting. And I'll never forget it. um, um, uh, Aaron Donald after week one saying that it's like he felt like he was back at a little league game, Pop Warner game, where he could hear his, his parents in the stands calling out his name, yeah. you know, during the game. It's just like, it's, it's just weird, man. I, I just, I, I just have not been able to adjust to that. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm curious, you know, home field advantage for the playoffs. I mean, I think it'll be big for Green Bay because of their weather factor. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious to see how much home field really, plays a role in these playoff games because they have lost that element um, of the fans and the noise and everything like that. Yeah. When we talked to Sean Payton about it, he didn't think that um, it mattered as much this year, whether you were a home team or a road team because of that, just that issue that, you know, fans aren't, aren't in the stadium or enough of them aren't in the stadium to really have an impact on a game. And, you know, I think he was joking when he said it to Steve and I, where he said they're trying to literally figure out ways that they can quarantine 70,000 New Orleans, you know, for a week in a hotel or whatever. And that way they can have them in the stadium for the game. Um, and, and I think he was joking, <laughs> but I can't say with 100% certainty he was joking. But my point to him was, Sean, if you said to fans, I'm sure if you quarantine for a week, um, you'll get to attend the game those Saints fans would take that seriously. And I think you would get 70,000 who would quarantine for a week and then show up for the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what has your thoughts been, you know, this season really started as far as a strong message from these players on, on social justice, on fighting um, racism. We saw the push uh, for voters um, rights and things like that. And guys uh, taking Lang's Patrick Mahomes oh, to get the, the equipment for the stadium for them to have voting, but it seems like it's really kind of quieted down. Uh, what has your opinion been of that mission that started so strong at the start of the season to where it is now? 
I, I don't think it's, um, it, it may have quieted in terms of what you hear, but I think the work continues and I think the work has always continued. You know, that was the one of the things having been around the Players Coalition when it first formed, um, everyone wants to look for these headlines. And the reality was these guys were doing work on a daily basis to try and make change in their communities and whatnot. And I think the same thing is going on now. The difference is, in my opinion, for instance, um, the election has already taken place. So stadiums aren't being used as polling places, those sorts of things. Um, so there's not anything like that to write about. We've had legislation that has been voted on. Um, so there's not anything to really say, okay, here's a target date, what's gonna happen here? What impact has this had? But that doesn't mean that the work isn't continuing for the next moment. And just yesterday, I believe it was, the Denver Broncos announced that their social justice um, uh, fund is committing, uh, the team is committing 250,000 plus to, uh, um, I wanna believe it's over 40 local, um, meaning Colorado causes, as well as causes in these players' hometowns. So that's why I say to you, the work is still going on. It hasn't stopped. Um, it's just that some of these big events where you would draw more attention to it, they've already taken place. Gotcha, gotcha. What, uh, what have you, what has impressed you the most just about how these players um, or these teams have gotten through the season from a competitive standpoint? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think it all, it all goes back to how they dealt with COVID. And again, the discipline that, that players and coaches and, and families have shown. That's the other thing here, if I could say that quickly, we talk so much about you know, the, the players and the coaches and the team employees, but recently for a story I was, uh, that I wrote um, in talking to the wives about the pressure they were feeling, knowing that if they had any lapse in judgment mm -hmm. and exposed themselves to um, some sort of behavior, that could lead to them testing positive for COVID and then they, them transferring it to their, their husband or spouse and then him transferring it to the team, you know, it weighed on these women that that could not only impact the livelihood of their, their, their significant other, but also the livelihood of everyone associated with them, meaning teammates, coaches, um, club employees, if the league had had to, to cancel games or to shut down the season. So, um, Again, I, I, I sometimes even and remiss in not recognizing their contribution to this season. Um, but I think for the playoffs, obviously, everything comes down first and foremost to health. And as you and I know, you know, the two things you want going into the playoffs are good health and, and momentum. And I don't think that that's changed at all. Um, you know, the games are the games. They'll take care of themselves but you want to be as healthy as possible and on a positive role if you can um, once we get to that second season. Yeah, you know, that's a pretty interesting element that you talked about because early on, I know a lot of players were talking about concern about taking it back to their families. Um, but yeah, that concern about families. And the league has said that as of late, these, these cases that we've seen are more so coming from the communities um, rather than, but yeah, that is a lot of pressure on, on family members to make sure that, um, you know, you're not putting your, your player, your husband, you know. At. Yeah, the thing, that, the thing that disappoints me, although it's predictable, is that, you know, to hear people say, I don't want to hear from them. They've got millions of dollars. What are they complaining about? All of us are dealing with this stuff. And, and that's part of the point here is that everyone is dealing with it, including these women. They're not, they're not any different from, you know, um, uh, you or me out in the, out in the public. And you know, yes, they have money, many of them have money, but in terms of being, being um, cautious, they're not allowing anyone in their homes. There are no babysitters, there are no nannies. Um, they have taken on the role of, 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 of homeschooling, you know, their children. And so when you talk to, for instance, Nikki Jordan, Cam, Cam Jordan's wife, and at the time she had three children, five or under, and she was pregnant with the fourth and was due in December. Now imagine you've got no help. You know, you're not allowing a babysitter in. There's no nanny. You're trying to homeschool these young kids, including, you know, kindergarten and pre-kindergarten. You're dealing with a pregnancy. And at the same time, you're trying not to um, put any undue burden on your husband, knowing that for him, he's got to be at his best physically and mentally 
for the season, um, that's a lot to carry, man. So when you talk, when I talk to Dr. Uh, Amber Cargill, who's the wellness director for the, for the M, uh, NFLPA, you know, and she says she hears the stories from these women about when they're crying in the shower and, and or in the bathroom and they can't get a break um, just to even go to the bathroom alone sometimes. Uh, I, I think, again, it comes back for me, that empathy thing. Um, we, we all need to feel for each other and recognize that COVID doesn't discriminate based on your income, yeah. you know, or your race or anything else. Um, it affects all of us. So, you know, let's try and, and, and treat each other with empathy and kindness. Do you feel like these players almost deserve even more credit for performing at a high level because of all that is swirling that they're dealing with? I mean, you know, I know that guys are helping homeschool their kids and, and there's more distractions um, going on. Uh, behind the scenes than in some years past. Yeah, I, I, th I think they deserve, these guys deserve a lot of credit. Um, the discipline that it takes, look, to think that there are almost 2000 NFL players and that every one of them believes that COVID is real and dangerous um, is foolish. As you and I know, sport is a microcosm of society. So just as there are people out in society that don't believe seriously in COVID and believe that it's as dangerous as, as medical professionals are telling us it is. I'm sure there are players who feel that same way. And yet, um, again, we haven't had any major outbreaks across teams in the league. So that's why I say they deserve a lot of credit and that, you know, whether they believe in it or not, they've taken it seriously enough that um, the league has been able to get through this season and hopefully get through the postseason without any major incidents. And another unsung hero um, or group of heroes is are the contact tracers. Um, you know, there was a call earlier this week when uh, Dr. Sales, the chief medical officer, was talking about how they have been so, you know, vital to keeping this from spreading throughout teams as they do the contact tracing and these people are working around the clock and everything um, to make sure that they figure out, okay, who do we isolate? How do we keep operating? Everything like that. There's just a lot, a lot of people beyond just the coaches and the players that we see um, that are really working hard to make sure that this season uh, continues without a hitch and has gotten, you know, as far that it, as it has. It's pretty, yeah, and you know, commendable. No question about that. No question. Everybody deserves. And again, I'm saying this against the backdrop that the union and the league made the decision that they were going to go forward. Right. I'm not saying this against a backdrop of whether or not games should have actually been played. But the fact that they decided to go forward, I think they have made the best of what potentially could have been a, a really bad situation. Hey there, you're up for getting down with low prices, right? Well, Kroger goes lower than low on food that's fresher than fresh. So when you're crushing on clementines, seeking a savory salad, or choosy about your chicken, just open the Kroger app. You'll get more ways to save on the fresh you love with personalized coupons, weekly sales, and rewards like fuel points all for prices that are even lower than the everyday low. So go where you know it's lower than low. Kroger, fresh for everyone. It's almost that time when you put your name in a grid and hope that your box hits the final score. But you don't have to wait until February to start winning. With Boxes, you can play box pools every day for every game. Boxes is completely free to play and you win big. Fans who download the app at the App Store or go to Boxes.com, that's B-O-X-I-Z.com, and use my code BALL20 can enter our contest with a lucky winner with the final score to the Jets-Patriots game will receive $100. We'll have new games every week and incredible prizes in the playoffs. And for the big game, that will include tickets to games next year when fans can finally return in 2021. So go to boxes.com for more info or download the app now. B-O-X-I-Z. Use the code BALL20 when you sign up and when you enter our contest for the Jets-Pats game. It's free for you and your friends to get in and win. Boxes. It's anyone's game. We're, we're coming up. Black Monday's looming. Um, and that's the day where... Coaches get fired, um, you know, sometimes it happens Sunday night, uh, but this whole coaching cycle is going to get started again. And I know that um, this is something that you have been monitoring for, for years now. Um, as we talk about 
coaches hiring, diversity always comes up. The league has made um, an effort this year. They've instituted, you know, more initiatives and things like that. And it's always been a debate, okay, you know, they feel very optimistic that maybe, you know, the rewarding of people for, for being promoted out of their organization, um, you know, trying to make sure that everybody hires or interviews more minorities, um, all this stuff they think is going to make a change, you know, and I asked Troy Vincent on a call a couple weeks ago, how will you guys know um, if this actually was a success? And, you know, they really don't know. But what is your sense? Um, because, I mean, I talked to some coaches who, some, you know, coaches of color who aren't so optimistic that things are going to change and that they will have the equal opportunity to pursue um, employment opportunities. Well, what's your sense on the climate, um, the receptiveness of owners and decision makers that they do want to make sure that they have diversity hires um, and fair representation this year? Well, first of all, I, I think it's just a shame that you have to try and incentivize this process for um, minority coaches to have a real opportunity to get either a head coaching or a GM job. I just, I fundamentally have an issue with that um, because I think it speaks to a culture that's not good for society and it's not good for business. So um, I don't think you should have to, and we've used the word before, bribe um, teams to do the right thing and not teams, but owners to do the right thing. Secondly, I do believe we will see some improvement this year. How much, I don't know. Um, you know, I think it is important for people like you and me to keep a spotlight on this and to hold people accountable and to make sure that their actions line up with their words. You can't talk about being um, about diversity and inclusion and the facts don't speak to that. And so I think, I think, I think we have to shine that spotlight on these folks. Um, and look, the reality is we're focused on right now head coaches and GMs, but the NFL at large has work to do. You know, when you talk about the league office, the lack of diversity and inclusion there at the top levels, when you talk about clubs, the, the NFL didn't get its first black club president until this year right. in Washington. I mean, so the NFL has a lot of work to do, period, not just among coaches and, and, and GMs. Having said all that, again, I do believe that right now we have, what, three head coaching openings and I think four GM openings. I do think we will, we will see some representation there. How much? I don't know, um, but I think it is important. And, you know, I go back to the conversation we had on the podcast with Arthur Blank, where, um, you know, in his book, he writes a lot about the importance of representation and diversity and this, that, and the other. And then I ask him, well, you know, when I look at your website and the top 19 executives in your club, there's only one person of color. How do I balance out your words versus your actions? And his response was, you know, candidly and maybe embarrassingly that he said, we've got to do better. And so I do anticipate that's one of the clubs where we will see um, a, a, a diverse hire either one or two, I, I don't know how many, but I think in that community down there, I think he understands the importance of, of that. So, you know, Mike, the thing that's so interesting to me, speaking candidly is whenever you bring up race in this discussion, mm -hmm. you get a group of people who always say, well, why can't teams just hire the best guy or the best person? Right. And my response to them is, you know what? I agree with you a thousand percent. You should hire the best person. But you can't tell me looking at the numbers that that's being done when you see certain individuals being passed over who are more qualified, at least on paper, than the people being hired. So the other, the other fear that I have, and I'm speaking as candidly as I can here, is that the target is going to get moved again. And what do I mean by that? Well, a couple of decades ago, Minority coaches were told, if you want to be a head coach, you got to come up through the defensive ranks. So everybody was over there. And then in the last X number of years, it's been, well, you got to be on the off offensive side of the ball and you got to be a coordinator and play car, all that. So many of the minority candidates are trying to rush over there to fill that vacuum. Yeah. And yet when the Giants hired Joe Judge, 
He was not a young offensive coach. No. And what did we hear from, from John Mara lately? That what really impressed him is that Joe Judge had the CEO presence. So is that going to be the next thing now as minorities flood into the offensive ranks to say, well, now we're looking for the CEO type. And I, I just, there's a part of me based on history that says, whenever we make moves to address what it is that owners say they want, they end up going in another direction then and saying there's something else that they want. Um, because you and I both know you can't sit here and say there are not qualified minority candidates to be head coaches and general managers in this league. That's just foolish. Yeah. I mean, there, there are guys who just don't even get sniffs. And then I know that it's upsetting to them when they see that nepotism is so strong. There are so oh. many head coaches who have sons that are, you know, climbing up the ranks, um, you know, when you have men who have played the game and have coached the game for decades and don't get an opportunity to even be coordinators, um, you know, that's, that's really a tough pill for them to swallow. Um, and so. I, I, I feel, I feel their pain. Look, they're on, <clears throat> this is what, what um, blew me away is that, you know, I, obviously I don't watch a lot of college football, but when I saw the number that of the, the power five conferences, there are only, uh, I believe the number is eight black head coaches among 65 schools. And, and, and none in the SEC and none in the big 12. I mean, so we keep focusing on the NFL, right. but this is a problem that goes below the NFL. If you, if you want to view, and some do, some don't view the college game as a feeder system to the NFL, Man, there are issues there that need to be addressed as well. So, and the, you know the what, excuse was that the but the pipeline excuse came up again, uh, which I'm like, uh, all you have to do is look at all those schools, and there are so many coaches of color. Um, how are you? How can you? How can you use that? Um, my, you know, look. Let's address that real quick here, Mike. First of all, if you're using that excuse, you you are being either disingenuous or intentionally deceitful. Yeah. Because we all know that there are coaches of color um, on the offensive side of the ball who deserve a shot to be a head coach. Having said that, if you focus on that, to me, you are missing um, the core of the problem here. And that is that owners don't know how to hire head coaches. No. Because the reality is, like, I I'm already getting this. Who are the hot names? Who should be considered? And my, my response to people who ask me that is, well, that's the wrong question to ask. The first question that should be asked is, what is an owner looking for in a head coach? What is his vision of a head coach? And how does that marry with what he wants in his organization? But so they for don't instance, know. That's my point. <laughs> so what are they doing here? They rely on search firms or they rely on other people to tell them who they should hire or they rely on, on media reports so that they can win the press conference, right. you know, and say they got the hot guy, which buys them times two or three years, um, that if it doesn't work, then they just do it all over again. So I'm saying if you don't address the fundamental issue here, that owners don't have a vision, a clear vision of what traits they want in a head coach, you're never going to get past this, in my opinion. So I need, so one of the things I'm proposing and just throwing out there. Um, is that if you are an owner, here's what I need from you before you ever even begin the process. I need you to make a checklist and tell me what your vision is for a coach. Do you want someone who has previous head coaching experience or not? Do you want someone who's younger or older? Do you want someone from a specific side of the ball, offense, defense, or special teams? Do you want someone um, who's hands-on or do you want someone who's a delegator? Do you want that CEO presence or do you want someone who's more mild matter? All of that, have that list. And when you make your hire, I want you to go back to that list and see how many of those traits that head coach actually meets. And then we will have a better idea of whether or not you're true to what your vision is for, for who you want leading your team. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and you know, it, it really doesn't matter whether a guy's an offensive guy or a defensive no. guy. It's can no. he lead? Can he motivate? Yes. Is he organized? Does he have a vision? 
that he can get guys to buy into, that he can communicate to his assistant coaches, that they can communicate to their players. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. Look, these guys all watch so much film. Any defensive guy can, can give you great insight on an offense or an offensive guy can give you great insight on defense, but can you lead? Are you, are you able to motivate? Um, that's what matters. But Mike, you know this. When you sit in that chair, much of your job responsibility is outside of football. Right. You're dealing with so many other things from the mundane to the major. I mean, you, you know, look, an offensive coordinator sits in that room and game plans, figures out his game plan with very little distraction. You're a head coach. Everything comes across your desk from what type of food you're going to eat in the cafeteria to what time you're going to practice early or late in the day, whether you're going to do it indoors or outdoors, um, how you're going to discipline players if it comes up, um, it, or if you're even going to discipline them, how you're teaching your, your assistant coaches. I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, just everything comes across a head coach's desk. W how you're going to dress for travel, um, all these things that you never have to worry about as a coordinator. So, pe so people are eating away at your time. So your ability to actually go in and do football stuff is, is limited. So that's why I say you can be the greatest um, offensive coordinator or play caller out there, or defense or whatever. It doesn't mean you're going to be a successful head coach. And the fact that, that since 2000, on average, we have had nearly seven head coaching changes per year on average since 2000 should tell owners that what they're doing is not working. So maybe it's time to try something else. Will they? I don't know. I mean, you can only hope, but I do know that what they are doing now is not working. Yeah. And my also, my concern is, is some of these coaches, you know, Hey, it looks like Eric Bieniemy is going to get a head coaching job this year. That's great. But, what is he going into? Does he have the chance to succeed? Is it going to be, because well-run organizations don't hire coaches a whole lot. So just because you get a coaching job isn't a good thing if it's a, a disaster. I mean, how many coaches has Washington, for example, gone through? It don't matter what color those coaches are. I mean, Joe Gibbs couldn't even have long-term success here when he came back the second time. And he's one of the greatest coaches um, to coach the game. These organizations, are the problem more so than even who these coaches are sometimes. I'm gonna tell you this, I, I, I just wrote a story that I think is gonna drop um, Friday, I mean today. And it's about whether or not it's more beneficial for owners to hire someone with previous head coaching experience than hire someone who has none. And when you talk to these coaches who have been head coaches previously, and why they feel they will be a better head coach the second time around. There are certain common threads that you find through the conversations with, with each of them. And number one is one of the things you're alluding to um, is the organization itself and whether or not there is synergy between a head coach and the front office. Are the visions of those two individuals and including ownership the same? Um, do they approach it the same? Um, I could give you, for instance, one of the guys I've talked to is Vance Joseph. And Vance said that he wishes, he knows now the next time he goes into, um, if he gets another opportunity, he will be more forceful is too strong a word, but he will not be shy about expressing his opinion when it comes to personnel mm -hmm. and how they are acquired and who is acquired. Because what he realized after he got to Denver is that basically he was hired because they viewed him as a plug and play guy, meaning he had experience with Gary Kubiak. He knew John Elway, all of these guys. He was from the, the Colorado area in terms of having attended college and all of that. And two years earlier, they had won a Super Bowl. And so they felt that, or what the way Vance viewed it is, who am I to come in and question them? And that two years ago, they had won a Super Bowl, even though in his mind, he's saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. And, and ultimately what the bottom line was, they were able to wait, they were able to get away with some things personnel wise because they had a future Hall of Fame quarterback and Peyton Manning mm -hmm. who could cover up many of those issues. And you had a future Hall of Famer on the defensive side and DeMarcus Ware who could help cover up some problems there. So you could piecemeal together 
a team and be successful. Well, when you don't have that Hall of Fame quarterback, you can't piecemeal a roster. You've got to build your foundation through that draft and whatnot. And they didn't do that. Um, in fact, I think there's only one player left on that roster from, from Vance's first year as head coach from the draft. So that tells you, you know, those things have to marry up. Those relationships have to marry up. Um, and then the other thing you hear a lot from these guys is that a real understanding of how the cap works, um, how to team build financially, um, how to have the cap within the cap. So there's just so many things that you hear that, that for me, um, I think there is value in looking at people who have done it before. And if you didn't, then you'd have guys like Bill Belichick and others who, who, who would no longer, um, who wouldn't be here right now. It's going to be an interesting off season. Um, and but here's the other point I would make to you. One of the things I'm pushing to, I know we're focused on head coaches and whatnot, mm -hmm. but I'm actually more, more focused on general managers mm -hmm. because we often are not even in the room. We meaning blacks are often not even in the room when this final decision is being made on who's going to be the head coach. Right. Now I realize the club president is probably the person who has the ear of the owner last, but in terms of football people, it is the general manager who has the last um, word with an owner about who should be hired and sometimes even who should be brought to the table. Yeah. Well, there are only two black general managers in the NFL. Yeah. So my thing is we need to increase those numbers in hopes of helping to level this field and getting more opportunities for people of color. I agree with you. And the, but the problem there is also is they know even less about personnel people than they do head coaches. I, I talked to, this is somebody high ranking in the league. And I had heard about different guys who were, you know, being recommended, um, you know, cause the, the diversity committee, you know, would do its homework. And there's a guy that was not mentioned. And I said, man, okay, this guy has been with his team as a college director for a number of years, has overseen a number of high quality drafts. Why is he not on there? And the person said, oh, he's got some cleaning up to do from his last stop. And I was like, wait a second, this guy has not been at that one team for seven years now. And I don't understand what, I don't know of anything that he had to clean up. They themselves had it wrong. And they're the people who are supposed to be in charge of this. So if we're gonna count on owners and team presidents, but that's why I think it's imperative that head coaches and general managers do a better job of promoting and, you know, and giving their assistants credit for the work that they do, because otherwise teams aren't going to know who to interview. They're not going to know who Mike, quality talent is. I'm going to tell you how bad, how bad it is. On the list of, of, of um, diverse candidates that the league is pushing, one of the names on there happened to be someone who is white. You know what they claim was that he had Native American descent. Because I, I know what you're talking about. And I was like, wait a minute here. It was brought to my attention. And that was the, that was the, the I don't want to say cover up, but. Mike. I know. Come on. That's how bad come it on. is. That's how bad it is. I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. All I'm going to say is that um, you don't even have to be well-versed in knowing who the people are. I know that Reggie McKenzie is a former executive of the year who was let go in, with the Raiders, not because he did a poor job, but because the owner wanted to bring in John Gruden, who wanted to bring in his own guy. How is it that Reggie McKenzie, who took a team that at that time had had, I think, eight straight losing seasons or something, non-winning seasons, had one of the worst stretches in league history, was 30 plus million over the salary cap, had no draft picks, mm -hmm until the compensatory picks in the third round. And within a few years, had that team um, in contention for a playoff spot, had Derek Carr not broken his leg and was named executive of the year. How is it that he doesn't have a job? How is it that, or a GM job? How is it that Jerry Reese, who was part of two Super Bowl champions with the Giants, doesn't have a job or a GM job? Um, I could go down the list with other guys who I think are, are, are talented, who have gotten a bad rap including Martin Mayhew, 
and the talent that he was able to procure in 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 Detroit. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, he should still be a GM someplace, you know. But it's funny the people who get second opportunities. Do you know that in the history of the NFL, the hundred one year history of the NFL, there has never been a black general manager who was fired who has gotten rehired in that same role someplace else. Never. Wow. Never. Wow. I mean, that's astounding when you consider some of the white um, candidates who have gotten second opportunities. It's just astounding. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think this year will be telling. But again, even if those guys do get jobs, what kind of support are they going to have that's going to position them for success? Um, but see, that's why it's important. And, and, and it's easy for me to say, because I'm not going after these jobs. But I always tell this story that when I when you play dominoes, my dad always would say to me, all money ain't good money. So you slap down that bone and you think I got 20 and he comes right behind you with that double five and he's got 30. And so I say to, to, to minority candidates, all jobs aren't good jobs. And the danger is you take one just because you feel you have to, right. that you might not get another opportunity. And the reality is, if you take it and it doesn't work, you're going to pay the price for it, not that club. Yeah. So make sure that your vision aligns with that team's vision. Because if you all aren't on the same page, you're not going to make it. Yeah. And you know, to me, it is a travesty that someone like Steve Wilkes, for instance, was the last coach hired in his hiring cycle Um, did not have a chance to put together his own staff, did not have a young franchise quarterback, and he gets fired after one year. And that team then has the number one pick and is able to go out and get a franchise quarterback. And the new coach benefits from that. The game ain't fair. No. So I'm saying to these guys, be careful. I know you want to be a head coach, but make sure that your vision for what it takes to be successful is shared by that team. Because if it's not, and when I say that team, I mean not only the front office, but the owner. Because if that vision is not shared, the likelihood of you succeeding, it's not very good. No, it's not. And the likelihood then of you getting a second opportunity is probably even less. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We've been on here for quite a while. I told you I was going to keep you on here for like 20 minutes or something like that. Um, and, and here we are at 40 something, almost 50 minutes. But it's all good. You know, man. We could go like we were saying, you know, we could really go on and on and on. And I appreciate your insight and your uh, your time. It's too important, man. It's too important. The conversation is too important. And um, I'll talk about it all day, you know, because I, I just I, I just believe that a disservice is being done to these men of color and, and the the spotlight needs to be um, placed in the right spot. And that spot is on the ownership. And I know that some in the league are trying to present this as there is no difference between the league and the owners. That's not true. The league has done everything it can to try and address this issue. Again, including going so far as to basically bribe teams to hire people of color. So this is not a league issue, this is an ownership issue. And owners have to believe or decide that having diverse head coaches and general managers is actually good for business and good business, period. Well, Trot, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being on. Tell everybody where, one more time where they can find you. Uh, You can find me in San Diego. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding uh you find me on twitter at jim trotter underscore nfl and you can also find me on the huddle and flow podcast with my colleague steve weish and our producer thomas warren uh on apple Podcasts or spotify Podcasts. you got three howard grads there we call ourselves the howard mob and um we're trying to have these conversations that you and i are having right now and be as authentic as we can in them good deal Everybody check them out. Thanks so much for your time. And I don't know when I'll see you physically face to face, but you know, it's good to see you on here. And always, I really appreciate, uh, you know, getting to talk with you. No, bro. You know, anytime it is my pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you.
Welcome to McDonald's. What can I get you today? Hi, she'll have the quarter pounder with cheese, extra mustard. No pickles. And I'll have a 10-piece chicken McNuggets. And, and two sides, sides of ranch, please. The we've done this before meal. Get it at McDonald's when you get two of your faves for just five bucks. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Single item at regular price. Okay. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hope you took something from it. We are going to see how serious the NFL is about diversity um, as this coaching cycle begins to kick off. And not just these teams have to make smart hires here. Nobody wants to be a token hire. It's about finding the best candidates. And so if you want to get coached up on who some of the best candidates are out there, go check out my story on usatoday.com on the 25 leading candidates expected to receive consideration um, this hiring cycle. That is live. You can uh, you know, educate yourself there, and we'll be following along. Hope you guys have a great day. Do me a favor, please. Share this podcast with your friends. Let's grow together in 2021. And I will talk to you guys again next time.